life, there's three things. There's our ability to choose what we're focused on, or to commit, to, to get a result, to put all our intention and focus into something. There's our ability to do the right things, to have the right strategy to execute. And then there's some grace. There's what some people call luck, some people call grace. There's if you do the right things over and over again and with total focus, sometimes, you know, you get good fortune that comes your way. And you tend to have more good fortune when you're totally focused and decisive and you take lots of action than if you kind of just sit around and accept things like that you don't have a future. What do you do like decades ago, half a century ago almost now, and someone says to you, go to the back of the bus and you're African-American. One woman just decided, you know what? You can't take my dignity from me. I can only give that up, but I don't choose to give it up. And I will not go back to the bus. The answer is no. Rosa Parks changed an entire society because that day she chose to focus on something else. She gave it a different meaning. This is not a command. You do not have control over me. And she decided to fight. And she changed the direction of a country and of many other countries. She started something. We forget that you don't have to be famous to have the ability to change at least your own personal history, change the direction we go in our life. We have the power to choose, even if you haven't before. You can finally say, no more, I won't put up with that, within myself or from anybody else. And here's what I'm gonna do differently. That's where the breakthroughs really start to happen. Now the question is, why do some people stand their ground and make something change versus other people just kind of accept things. Why do some people make bold decisions and other people make decisions that are based on trying to hang on to what they've got? Well, that's a more complex question to answer than we might have in a few minutes in this one session, but it is one that I've spent my life studying because when you can change your decisions, you can change your life. When you can change the force that controls your decisions, you can change anything in your life. At some level, we have certain beliefs and values. But if I was going to make it simple, I'd say there's two things that determine your choices. The first thing is the state of mind and emotion you're in at that moment. Think about it. Have you ever snapped at somebody and had nothing to do with them? It was just the state you're in, right? You're frustrated, you're pissed off about something, and in that state of mind, whatever they said got interpreted through that state, and you made it a meaning like they were an irritant or they were interrupting you, they weren't. Probably felt bad afterwards. When we get in the wrong state, we make the wrong decisions. When you get in a strong, empowering state, you'll make a better decision. Learning how to direct your state is a big part of what my work is with people, and it's a big part of what I do in my seminars, but the other thing that affects your decisions would be what I would call your story or your blueprint. We all have kind of a story about how our life is supposed to be. It comes from a set of life experiences, interpretations. Some people think life is all about getting theirs. Some people think life is about growing and contributing. Some people think life is about making judgments. Some people think life is about saving other people's lives. Some people think life is about being successful. Some people think God is the basis of everything and the way to know God is to go through life in a very specific way with a set of rules and they follow it. And that's what they believe. Whatever your story is, whatever your blueprint, your blueprint is just another way of saying whatever you believe is how your life is supposed to be, at some level, we either follow that blueprint or we fight it. If we follow it or we fight it, we're going to find that we're going to bump into things in life where life isn't always the same as we expect it to be or think it should be. And that's where we start to experience stress. When you make love, do you breathe in unison while you're making love? And invariably the guy would go, huh? And I'd say, let me explain. You're here telling me about all these things you're upset with each other about. And you can talk about these things to your blue in the face, but the real problem is you don't feel connected. You don't feel well. And I said, you don't have that feeling of total oneness with each other. And talking more about this is not going to change it. So if you really want to change this, I suggest you do this. And if you do what I'm telling you, you still need me, I'll give you one of my lunches. So I, I want, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home and I want you to make love for an hour and a half minimum. And while you're doing it, I want you to breathe in unison the entire time with each other. Because what happens is you feel totally connected as one. 
out of who knows three to four dozen people I asked to do that, only one person ever called us back and wanted to be able to do a session. Because the bond is there. So try it. Not now, later this evening. Plus, the great thing about mirroring somebody's breathing, it's very subtle. No one's going to jump on their chair and say, Would you stop mirroring my breathing? And they're not going to notice. So you got breathing, you got posture, you got gestures, you got facial expressions, you got eye contact. What else could you mirror? Come on, use your brain. I know the answer. I want to see if you can come up with it. Come on. What else could you mirror? Proximity. Good. What does proximity mean? Proximity means everybody has a certain amount of space that they need to be comfortable. And it's different for every single person you're going to meet in your life. One skill you want to master in this day and age that we live in, if you want to have an extraordinary life, it's the ability to learn rapidly. Because today, there is more opportunity to do more things, learn things, create things, experience things than any time in human history. But most people are way, way, way behind the times unless they grew up with technology and learning. So I would like to start this morning by showing you the strategy for learning. What is learning? So if we take a human being, and uh, this will be a drawing of a human being, so you can see that again I majored in art. Magnificent, isn't it? <laughs> so if we take a human being, and we want to be able to have them learn something, what is learning? Well, learning is the creation that does not represent the highest in me. You decided that even though I have eight children that I'm not taking care of, I just see women as, as a receptacle for my orgasms, you decided that you're going to throw your life away for crap. When you look in the mirror, you should have contempt for who's looking back at you. Because now you're no good to yourself or those eight children that you have. Don't tell me about the man. Tell me about the man in the mirror. Then look at your life. Here's what I know. You are stronger than anything that you're facing. Anything. And when you harness your will, when you retrain your thinking, when you jump out of line, when you decide to become an independent thinker, when you make decisions, see, if you just do two or three things well, listen to me. If you do two or three things well and just make the decisions not to do a variety of things wrong, like following the crowd, like doing drugs, like drinking and pottering and pottering and, and, and wasting valuable time. If, if you decide to not to do a lot of things wrong, you can make it in this thing called life. What I've learned is that there, I can break it down into four pieces, right? There are four, four things, four characteristics. One is parenting, the other one is uh, technology, the third is impatience, and the fourth is environment. The generation that we call the millennials, too many of them grew up um, subject to, not my words, failed parenting strategies, you know? Where, for example, they were told that they were special all the time. They were told that they could have anything they want in life just because they want it, right? They were told, um, uh, some of them got into um, honors classes not because they deserved it, but because their parents complained. And some of them got A's not because they earned them, but because the teachers didn't want to deal with the parents. Some kids got participation medals. They got a medal for coming in last, right? Which the science we know is pretty clear, which is it devalues the medal and the reward for those who actually work hard. And that actually makes the person who comes in last feel embarrassed because they know they didn't deserve it. So it actually makes them feel worse, right? So you take this group of people and they graduate school and they get a job and they're thrust into, an, into the real world and in an instant they find out they're not special 
the moms can't get them a promotion, um, that you get nothing for coming in last, and by the way, you can't just have it because you want it, right? And in an instant, their entire self-image is shattered. And so you have an entire generation that's growing up with lower self-esteem than previous generations. The other problem to compound it is we're growing up in a Facebook, Instagram world. In other words, we're good at putting filters on things. We're good at showing people that life is amazing even though I'm depressed, right? And so everybody sounds tough and everybody sounds like they got it all figured out. And the reality is there's very little toughness and most people don't have it figured out. And so when the more senior people say, well, what should we do? They sound like, this is what you got at it. And they have no clue. <laughs> So you have an entire generation growing up with lower self-esteem than previous generations, right? Through no fault of their own. Through no fault of their own, right? They were dealt a bad hand. Some of you, you are taking too much time trying to convince people to love you that do not matter. Some of you are taking way too much time tolerating and trying to get people engaged that don't matter, that don't care, that are never ever going to help you get into your destiny. I felt like saying to you this week, if somebody can walk away from your life, let them walk away. You shouldn't have to convince anybody to love you. If they can walk, let them go. If they leave you, it means they're not attached to your future. When people can walk away from you, let them walk. I don't want you to try to talk another person into staying with you, loving you, calling you, caring about you, coming to see you, staying attached to you. I mean, hang up the phone. When people can walk away from you, let them walk. I don't care how wonderful they are. I don't care how attracted you are to them. I don't care what they did for you 20 years ago. I don't care what the situation is. When people can walk away from you, let them walk. Because your destiny is not tied to the person who left. Your destiny is never tied to anybody that left. The Bible said that they came out from us, that it might be made manifest that they were not of us. For had they been of us, no doubt they would have continued with us. People leave you because they're not joined to you. And if they're not joined to you, you get super glue and you can't make them stay. Let them go. And you've got to know when people's part in your story is over so that you don't keep trying to raise the dead. you got to know when it's dead, David. When your boy is dead, wash your face and have another baby. you got to know when it's over. Look at somebody and say, nothing just happens. If they walked away, it's no accident. If they left, it's no accident. If you tried to make it work and it wouldn't work, it's no accident. Accept it as the will of God. Clap your hands, wash your face, do your dance, and keep going. No, oh, baby, 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 don't make me preach it. Let me tell you something. I, I got the gift of goodbye. I mean, I got the gift of goodbye. It's, it's a 10th spiritual gift. I believe in goodbye. It's not that I'm hateful. Is that I'm faithful and I know whatever God needs for me to have, he'll give it to me. And if it takes too much sweat, I don't need it. Stop begging people to stay. Let them go. What if I told you that some of the rejection you have been facing in your life, it's because people are jealous of what's on your life? What if I told you that the rejection is simply an indication that you got favor on your life? God is getting ready to do something in your life. You just got to understand there's more to know. Come on, somebody. There's more to know. You got to make sure that when rejection hits you, you don't let it get in you. Because there's no escaping rejection. There's no escaping hearing the word no. If you're going to actually live your life to do something bigger than yourself, you should get used to hearing no, but you shouldn't let no stop you. It could hit you, but don't let it get in you. I began to realize at the end of the day, 
As long as there's breath in my lungs, there's hope in our hearts, and giving up's not an option. You and I and we, no matter what your unique situation, your storm, your struggle, your trauma, your abuse, your wounds, your scars, no matter what they are, and I know we've all got them on some way, some way, somehow, some level, whatever they are, I promise you this, you are not a product of your past, you are not a product of your environment or your current unique situation, but you are always a product of how do we navigate gate through our storm but you know what else I had to realize I was allowing things that I couldn't control to control me you see growing up I blamed everything on my dad I blamed everything on him he was the reason that I skipped school he was the reason for my attitude he was the reason that I, I, I went to drugs he was the reason for my suicidal thoughts he was the reason for every destructive behavior like I blamed everything on him being ripped out of my life but you know what I had did I had walked into this trap I was allowing things that I couldn't control those situations that you didn't sign up for you didn't want to have to deal with it knocked it came in front of you and I allowed that thing that I had no say over I allowed that to control me for so long I was allowing things that I couldn't control to control me and I had to realize I had to take control of what I can only control I can't control what you think what you say or how you treat me I can't always control the situations the struggles the adversities the abuses the hurts the pains that other have caused me but I can always re I can always control how I react, how I respond, and what I do. I had to take control of me, control what you can control. And truthfully, the first thing that I had to do, which was the most difficult thing that I had to do, I had to realize the anger, the rage, the hurt, the frustration, the pain that I had towards my dad, I had to let it go. And I was scared to let it go because I had had so much identity tied up in my wounds, but I had to learn I am more than my struggle, I am more than my wound, I have to let it go letting it go and forgiving him didn't justify it didn't make it right for him but if a family could forgive me for taking the life of their daughter how could I continue to understand this that the anger the frustration the madness the pain that I had towards my dad it was only poisoning me and I had to let some things go and that's a challenge because for so long, that pain, that wound, it really became like a safety net for me. Because it was my go-to, it was my reason for all of my struggles. And if I let it go, then I had to begin to face some of my other hurts and my pains. And that's intimidating and it's scary. But the truth is, when we hold on to these things, it's not poisoning the people who did it to us. It's only holding you hostage. And so, I let it go. It didn't justify it. It doesn't make it okay. It doesn't mean that me and my dad became best of best of buddies. But it allowed me to begin to continue to pursue purpose. And we all got a purpose. Every one of you in this room, you were born to leave your fingerprints on history. Every one of you in this room were born to not just exist, but to experience life. But until you let go of some of the things that you've allowed to define you for so long, you know why? Sometimes we can't change and we can't overcome the suicidal thoughts, the self-injuring mentality, our anger, our rage, our wounds, because all you have been doing for so long, you're consumed by it. All you do is focus on it. It's everything about you and what you feed and what you focus on, what you feed grows and what you focus on magnifies. And I realized if I stopped being consumed about that, but found the courage to let it go and stop being self-absorbed but begin to walk even while I was still wounded begin to move towards my dream and I realized what I give away I'm going to keep and I started looking to my friends, my peers, my community of other people with storms and struggles. And I began to recognize what gave me real worth, real passion. What helped me really overcome is this, giving 
What you give away, you get to keep. When I started having empathy towards my friends, being of somebody that would listen, getting involved in other people's situations and helping them. Why does that help me? Because it took my eyes off my struggle and it put my eyes on beginning to help others. And when I helped others, it gave me real self-worth, real self-value. What you give away, you get to keep. You have to take the hand you've been dealt and make the most of it. Nothing that's happened to you has stopped your destiny. That person that did you wrong, they walked away. It may have been painful, but they didn't ruin your life. They don't have that much power. If they could stop God's plan, they would be bigger than God. Don't let one bad break, one injustice, one difficult season cause you to be sour. Have a chip on your shoulder. When we go through loss, things we don't understand, that victim mentality will always come knocking at the door. We have to make the choice. Are we going to live bitter, discouraged, thinking we're a victim of our circumstances? We're a victim of the loss, a victim of this unfair boss, a victim of this pandemic? Or are we going to believe that God is in control, that he's ordering our steps, that his plans for us are for good? Instead of having a victim mentality, switch over to a victor mentality. That bad break is not how your story ends. The loss, the sickness, the injustice is not going to limit the rest of your life. God said in Isaiah, he will pay you back double for the unfair things that have happened. If you're going to see the double, you have to know that God is going to make it up to you. It may be unfair, but God is a just God. He saw what happened. He knows who hurt you, what you lost, what you're struggling with. He's not going to just bring you out. He's going to bring you out better. Get rid of that victim mentality. Quit dwelling on who hurt you, what you lost. You're not a victim. God always causes you to triumph. That bad break wasn't fair. You didn't like it, but what you can't see is it set you up for double. That boss that overlooked you, you didn't get the credit. You could feel like a victim. No, get ready. God's going to make it up to you. That set you up for promotion, increase, favor that you wouldn't have seen if that had not have happened. And here's the key. Nobody can make you be a victim. They can do things that are not fair. You can go through things you don't like, you don't understand, but none of that can force you to have a victim mentality. You have to give permission to become a victim. You have to make that choice. I'm at a disadvantage. This bad break has stopped my future. I'm asking you to not give permission. Are you going to get upset? Start thinking about how you're going to pay them back? Or are you going to kiss it goodbye? and keep running your race, enjoying your life. Those adversaries are getting you prepared for your destiny. Where you're going, there will be opposition, critics, people trying to pull you down. The good news is no weapon formed against you will prosper. They cannot stop you. The forces that are for you are greater than the forces that are against you. Stay on the high road and stay focused on what God has put in your heart. You don't have time to get distracted by all the negative chatter. What people think about you is none of your business. What they're saying shouldn't concern you. There'll always be somebody that doesn't like you. Kiss it goodbye and keep moving forward. Now there may be some relationships you need to kiss goodbye. Now, I'm not talking about your husband or your wife. Somebody just thought they got their word for 2019. Your time is too valuable to spend it with peace stealers, people that try to get you all riled up, or with dream killers, people that tell you what you can't become, or with compromisers, people that cause you to give in to temptation. Joel, I've had this friend a long time. If I don't hang out with them, they may get upset. What you're unwilling to walk away from is where you'll get stuck. If you don't kiss the wrong people goodbye, you'll never meet the right people. And if someone is not adding value to your life, making you better, pushing you towards your destiny, you need to make a change. 
And sometimes it's just a new season. The friends you had five years ago may not be the friends you need now. Everybody can't go where you're going. It doesn't mean they're not good people. You've just outgrown them. You're going at a faster pace. And if you continue hanging around them, it will limit your growth. You need to gradually spend less and less time with them. If someone is supposed to be in your life, you can't make them leave. And if someone leaves easily, they're not supposed to be there. Quit trying to talk people into staying. You don't have to convince anyone to love you, to call you, to come see you. You are a gift. You are a prize. You have something amazing to offer. If they don't want to be there, that's a sure sign they're not supposed to be there. God has people already ordained that you can't make leave. People that want to celebrate you. People that love spending time with you. If somebody wants to leave, let them leave. Your destiny is not tied to the people that walked away. Be respectful, but kiss the orcas goodbye. product of prayer. I'm a product of grace, mercy, forgiveness. I'm also a product of my imagination. See, I imagine something. I was 10 years old, 1968. I was in a school and we had came off summer vacation. A teacher came in the class and said, I want everybody to write their name on a piece of paper and write on that paper what you want to be when you grow up. What you don't know about me is when I was growing up, I had a severe stuttering condition. I couldn't talk outside my house. For years, I studied what you don't know about me is I flunked out of school, I'm telling you. You also don't know about me that I've lost everything I ever owned twice. I have lost it all twice and had to start over. I didn't struggle through two marriages to finally get this one right over here. I'm just telling you about me. You may not know, I lived in a car for three years. I washed up behind bushes, man. See up. So when I wrote on a piece of paper, I want to be on TV, teacher had everybody stand up in the class, and she read their name and what they wanted to be. She saved me for last. She called me to the front. I'm thinking, okay, this is it. I've been in school six years. I ain't never got a gold star. This is it. I'm finna get a gold star. This the moment I've been waiting on. Six years, I ain't never had an A. I ain't never had a star. Look, I'm finna go up here get this star. So I headed up to the front. I can't even tell you how wrong I was. That lady didn't call me up there to give me no gold star. She called me up there to humiliate me, to embarrass me. First of all, she knew I studied severely. Why would you call me to the front of the class and you know I can't talk? And she brought me up there, boy, and she lit in on me. Why would you write something like this on a piece of paper? Who in this school ever been on TV? Who in this neighborhood ever been on TV? Who in your family that ever been on TV? And look at you standing there. You can't even talk. How they gonna put somebody like you on TV? So every Christmas, I send her a flat screen TV. Cause I don't want her to miss me. I want her to see that little country boy out of Welch, West Virginia. The one that had a stuttering problem. The one that flunked out of school. Yeah, I was telling you, you gotta learn how to fail and win anyhow. I wanted her to see that little boy that lived in a car for three years. The one who been through all them divorces, lost everything else. I wanted her to see me. I wasn't bragging to her, but I wanted her to see what God had done for me in spite of everything she said about me. You ain't gonna ever be nothing. You ain't in my imagination. You can't tell me nothing. See, I did not know then what I know now, that imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attraction. See, now here go the kicker so you can tie it in if you want them real churchy folk and you got to have everything put to a scripture. That imagination is the second half of that scripture. Uh-oh, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Your imagination is the evidence of things not seen because in your imagination, can't nobody see it but you. Now, if you're in here and you think you're too old to hear what I'm saying to you, my best example is Kentucky Fried Chicken. I don't know if you noticed the picture of the man on the bucket, but he old. He ain't 30 years old. Colonel old. Colonel had been telling people his whole life, I got the best chicken in the world. Ain't nobody believe him. Kentucky Fried Chicken sell more chicken than anybody in the world. 
So if you're sitting in here thinking you're too old, I'd rather be rich and hit it in my 60s than to die poor and never have hit it at all. Now, last thing, and I'm out your way. Imagination is everything. It's the preview. Let me ask you a question. When you go to the movie and you get that real early, and you get your popcorn and you sit down. Before the movie starts, what do they show? A preview of a coming attraction. Have you ever seen a preview and the movie ain't come out? Oh, the movie coming out. Whether you go or not, the movie coming out. Whether you like the trailer or not, that movie do a hundred million at the box office. You might not like the actor. That actor get an Oscar for that movie. The moral of the story, the next time your heavenly father shows you a preview, go to the movie. You're probably starring in it. I bet you'll like it when you get out there. It's going to happen quickly. We all have things that we're believing for. We've been patiently waiting, thanking God, praying, but we don't see anything improving. It's easy to get discouraged and accept that it's going to be this way a long time. We just have to endure it. But God said in Isaiah 60, I am the Lord. When the time comes, I will do it quickly. God has ordained certain moments in your life where he's going to do a quick work. It's going to happen much faster than you thought. You may not see anything changing. It doesn't look like you're any closer to what you were believing for than you were last year. But when you come into your time, God is going to do it quickly. It's not going to be a long, drawn-out process. You're going to see a rapid turnaround, a sudden breakthrough, a speedy recovery. It may look like it's going to take a long time for you to get well, to break the addiction, to meet the right person. Now get ready. It's going to happen sooner than it looks. It's going to be unusual, out of the ordinary. You're going to know it was the hand of God. Your goals and your objectives, they pull you through. They pull you through all kinds of down days. They pull you through a difficult time. It'll pull you through some winter of your life. Some people get lost in the confusion of the day simply because their goal is not bright enough to pull them through. What five things have you already accomplished that you're proud of? Let's take some credit before we go to work on the future. We've accomplished some things in the past. Let's give ourselves credit for that. When you're working with kids, this is important. What five things have you already accomplished that you're proud of? So I want you to make a note of that question and then I want you to do the exercise. Make a list of five things that you can think of that you've already accomplished that you're proud of. Sometimes even for kids, you have to do a little coaching. You know, sports or school or whatever. Did you win a blue ribbon? Did you come in first? So this is part of this format to do a little coaching to help people, you know, get through these exercises. Okay, five things you've already accomplished that you're proud of. Okay. Now, here's the next exercise, and this is going to take some time. Next question, what do you want in the next 10 years? I want you to make a list of at least 50 items. Now, this is not what you think you can get. This is what you want. If everything fell into place and you could have anything you wanted in the next 10 years, what would that list be? Not something you think you can earn, not something you think you can buy, not something you think you can finally be so successful you can get. This is what would really do it for you the next 10 years? I want you to make this list. And here's the deal now. I want you to put each item one under the other. Not side by side, but one under the other. And make as long a list as you possibly can in the time I'm going to give you. One underneath the other. Because we're going to do some things with this list when you finish. Just start writing now as fast as you can. Abbreviate where you can. Make a longer list. If something's private, put it in code so nobody could figure it out. They got a hold of this list. One underneath the other. As fast as you can write. Just let your dreams run free here. Not what you think you can get, but what you want. If everything fell into place and you could have whatever you wanted the next 10 years, what would that be? Little things, major things, insignificant things, doesn't matter. Just make the list. Places you want to visit. What experiences would you like to have in the next 10 years? Parachute out of an airplane, star in a movie, play in a rock and roll band, win a gold medal in the Olympics, start a new family. Some changes you'd like to make, some habits you'd like to drop, some new ones you'd like to acquire. You might make a list of the people you want to meet over the next 10 years. A cabin in the mountains, a upstairs maid, a, a cook, a chauffeur. How about your investments, properties, 
What would really do it for you the next day? What would do it for you? Become a wine connoisseur. I'm learning more and more how to make wine. It's an interesting process. A hobby you'd like to start. Collecting. New car. Become a race driver. Skills you want to help teach your children. I taught my girls how to swim, how to dive. Such great satisfaction when they used to say, watch me, daddy. Watch me. Look how good I am. You taught me. Watch me. Make a contribution to society. Make a contribution to your community. I want you to look at an item and say, I think that would take about one year. Another item, you say, I think that would take about three years. Another item, I think that would take five. And another item, looks like that's going to take ten. Give each item now a number of what you think it might take to achieve that goal. A one, a three, a five, or a ten. Just somewhere close, doesn't have to be exact. That's about a one, that's about a three-year goal, that's about a five-year goal, that's about a ten-year goal. If it's less than one year, just make it a year. If it's more than ten, just make it ten. Ten plus. Thank you. 